Welcome to Dan and Ellen. Hi there. It's always so fun to be here. It's like the best place. If you're an author, this is the best place ever to give a talk. So, uh, so yeah, I'm Ellen Lupton and I'm a curator. And what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to talk a little bit about my new book, uh, which is also an exhibition at Cooper Hewitt that's open till Christmas, so come up and see it up on the Upper East Side at, at Cooper Hewitt. And then Dan's going to talk about his book. And what's really nice is that both of these books are about how designers work and how they think. Um, so in my project, we looked at, um, yeah, that's how posters work. We looked at our collection at Cooper Hewitt. We wanted to do an exhibition from our collection. We have 4,000 posters. But we didn't want to do another kind of history of style or greatest hits show. We really wanted to use these posters to talk about bigger ideas in graphic design. Um, and so the show is organized around these 14 design principles. And I'm just going to talk about two of them tonight uh, very briefly so that then we can see how Dan actually has used a lot of these principles himself. Never read my book. <laughs> I mean afterwards. <laughs> anyway, it's funny how I was trying to look at kind of the history of posters and, and what people are doing and see if they actually make sense, like if people actually use these ideas. And, he says it works, and that's kind of nice. Um, yeah, so, so there's these 14 ideas, and in the, in the first room of the exhibition, there's, there's warring ideas. So I really wanted to show that there's principles in design, but they're not rules, right? So that you could use some of them and, and reject them as well. So, so the first idea in the show is called Focus the Eye. And it's really about the, the basic thing you learn in, in design school, right? Is to get rid of all the extra shit, right? And put something in the middle so that people know where to look and use color and form and composition, light, right? So the people know where to look, so the people know where the focus is. So these are two posters from the early, mid 20th century. One's a World War II poster, the other is for the Spanish Civil War. And they both have like a big object in the middle. Um, and that object is bright and it attracts light and we know where to look. Um, and it really, it's, even though there's a lot of detail and they're fairly realistic posters, they're very focused, right? They, they have a very strong uh, point. Um, but one of the things that impresses me when I look at these is that they also both have a strong diagonal element. Um, and if those objects were simply statically uh, centered, I don't think the posters would be as, as interesting. So this is a poster for the Spanish Civil War. Um, it's promoting how the democratically elected government had improved hygiene and was fighting the fascist rebels um, through public works and through clean water and so forth. Um, and I look at this poster and I, I like imagine if that glass were straight, this would be a really boring poster. So of course I had to try it in Photoshop. Right? I could do this all day, right? The straight, the crooked, right? And it's just so much better the way the designer uh, made it. Uh, Bruno Minari is a great Italian designer who, who wrote an essay in the 60s making fun of posters that look like this, and he, he called it the Japanese flag effect. Um, and he noticed that, that many poster designers had a very simple solution for how to design a poster, which was simply to put a big round thing in the middle. Um, and that would just trap people's eye and they would have no place else to look. So of course I had great fun looking through the museum's collection and finding all the examples of posters that just have a big circle right in the middle, um, like these two uh, really classic uh, pieces that, that follow exactly the thing that Bruno Minari was making fun of. Um, but then there's posters like this. This is a recent poster by uh, Felix Fafli, who's a young Swiss designer. And he takes that same rule, but he kind of turns it inside out. And instead of having a big shape stuck in the middle, there's an empty space, right? There's this void. Um, it's like the sun, like blinding you in the eye. And to me, this is like the most amazing one color poster I've ever seen, right? It's just like so minimal and such um, 
there's almost nothing there, and that's kind of the point, right? That what we're looking at at the middle is a big nothing, um, and that's what makes it powerful. Um, in the same gallery is this other idea, overwhelm the eye, which a lot of your work does, even though we still know where to look. It's this kind of crazy psychedelic thing. Um, so posters like these, of course, from the 60s and, and beyond that are really about um, giving the viewer a kind of sensual onslaught and this kind of crazy experience. Um, and we see designers today doing this with digital tools and creating something that isn't easy to look at and doesn't have a simple direct message, but becomes more of um, an optical trip, right? I think a lot of your stuff I is think an it's, optical trip. I think it's almost trip. a form of decoration at that point. Um, it's like you have your content and you turn it into like a, a, a carpet. Uh, and I, and yeah. I think it, it's less about focusing the eye and more about, like you said, overwhelming the eye and just kind of blowing it all out there. Yeah, and these are posters that you might want to live with, like a, like a carpet. They're not telling you what brand of soda to drink. They're giving you um, another kind of experience. So I'm going to kind of pass it over to you to talk about your right. ideas. That's your thing. Uh, thanks for coming out, everyone. I always feel weird talking into a microphone, like I'm, I should be dancing along with it or something. Um, but uh, what I did, every time I do one of these presentations, I, I, I make a new one. I don't go around the world and like give my same presentation over and over again. Um, and so for this one, what I really wanted to do was to take uh, Ellen's book and, and look at these 14 principles of design that she has outlined in there and actually see if I use them. Uh, so after reading her book, I went through and, and took notes on my own work and uh, I tried to find places where I thought uh, these 14 elements uh, were actually proven. Um, but before I go too far into that, I wanted to talk about one of the fundamentals of design, or maybe the fundamentals of art, which are line, shape, color, and texture. <clears throat> And when you pick up a pencil and you draw something, like here on the left, you, you draw lines, and that's usually how people approach art. They, they draw their sketch or they, they, you know, whatever they're doing, they're, they're etching some kind of line work, and then they, they fill it in with color. Um, my work generally kind of skips over the line and the texture part and concentrates almost entirely on shape and color. Uh, if you look, uh, I do most of my work in Illustrator. Uh, so even if I've sketched out something f beforehand, when I make a shape, it's a complete shape. It's an object. It already has color. It does not have line. So really what I do is I, I make my shapes and then I kind of collage them into things. So it's a lot less about, oh, I drew this guy's head and I drew these things around his ears. It's more like I had these shapes and then I, I collaged them together into this uh, final design, uh, in this case for Stereolab. And another thing I, I really don't work with too much is texture. Um, I feel like texture has become very disingenuous these days. Uh, you can easily make something in Photoshop or Illustrator and then th at the very last moment you can hit the ye old texture button or you can, you can scan the bottom of your shoe and put it on there and be like, ooh, it looks like it's 50 years old. That's kind of bullshit, right? I mean, you, it isn't 50 years old. So is that really adding to the story or is it just some kind of window dressing you're putting on top. So when I do use texture, I try to make sure it's actually helping do something in the poster. Um, so for instance, on of Monsters and Men, the, the snake is supposed to look like it's coiling around the figure. So in order to do that, I needed to create that subtle gradient effect, um, which is done with an atomizer, which is one of those old school things you blow into that we used to use to put glue on stuff a million years ago. Um, and then uh, uh, Zombies versus Cheerleaders, which is uh, a comic book, um, and it's, it's entirely an excuse to have scantily clad women smashing zombies. It's, that's what it's all about. So I wanted to do kind of like a, a Frank Miller style blood splatter on that. So that's actually done with a, a, a toothbrush and a knife where you scratch it over it. And, um, but I feel like that adds to the story as opposed to just uh, being a little bit of a, of a filter you put on top. 
uh, overlap and overprinting. This is one of the things that is in the book. They talk a lot about overlap because the way we see is, is flat surfaces. You know, it's kind of like cubism. You're looking at all these different flat surfaces, and your eye and your brain are putting them together into something that has meaning, uh, that creates depth. So if I put a picture of one chair in front of a picture of another chair, I get the illusion that the chair in front is closer to me, even though they're both on the piece of paper. Um, so something I do with, with uh, overlap is that I tend to just simply print both my colors of ink right on top of each other. Um, so you can see like in Sonic Youth, you get this, this movement uh, that you get through that overprinting. Uh, it's also, the, the way I came up with this was simply, when I first started doing this, I didn't have enough money to uh, run a lot of, uh, each, when you screen print, these are all screen printed, each color is an extra run through the press. So a three color print is more work than a two color print. Uh, a four color print is twice as much work as a two color print. So especially if you're printing them by hand, you really try to economize. So I started just doing this overprinting thing. It eventually kind of became a hallmark of what I do. So if you look at uh, the Arctic Monkeys here, that's uh, technically a four color color print. Um, it's really only three, except I added some black for the eyes and the phone. Uh, but you can see how it adds up. Uh, you get a lot of uh, extra bang for the buck just by laying your colors right on top of each other. You know, basic color theory where your uh, blue and green, or blue and uh, yellow make green, etc. Back to the Japanese flag. I love that it was called, I'd never heard that term before. Um, and also, uh, Plakastil, which is, I believe, a German word for poster style, um, but it sounds a lot cooler in German. Um, the uh, Early in the days of postering, back before it became sort of a more advanced form of advertising, somebody, you may even know who, uh, developed this style where they simply put one thing in the middle. If they're so it's in the book. If they're selling a typewriter, it's a picture of a typewriter with the name of the typewriter company. Bam. Um, and that was kind of a new radical idea at one point in time was, was you know, we're selling shoes. Shoes. It's a picture of a shoe. Uh, and that's kind of what I do with a lot of my work is that I, I even though I, I dress it up with a lot of additional psychedelia and bits around the edges, it really usually only is one object. There's one thing going on that should call your eye to it. Um, but I really like this Japanese flag thing because, you know, I have in fact done exactly that before. Um, <laughs> This one for Girl Talk was, uh, if you're familiar with Girl Talk's music, he takes hundreds and hundreds of samples and weaves them into one song. So what I was trying to do here was to, to show what it would look like to have a record that was made out of uh, all these different samples woven together. Diagonal, another one that she touched on. It, it makes everything interesting if you put it on a diagonal. Um, it, it creates action. And also the, uh, the western eye, at least, is reads from left to right and then returns and then reads from left to right again. So if you look at X hex, it makes a Z left to right, back down, then left to right again. Um, the Ski Colorado, he, you know, the man is descending straight down the mountain. Everything in the print, aside from the type, is really directing your eye down in that diagonal. Uh, it's also he's uh, moving to the right-hand side of the page, which for Western readers is the future, like into the future. Um, if he were skiing the, if this was, for instance, a book about a man who skied and, and died, I would flip it because he would then be skiing into the past, um, which would make him look like he was dying or something was wrong. It, it's amazing how your, how your eyes actually train that way. Storytelling. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what the story on the left is, you can probably imagine. Um, but it's, it's a really important thing to my work because uh, I was trained more as a graphic designer. Um, I was a self-taught illustrator and then went to design school for, uh, for graphic design. And, and everything was about, you have to have a concept. You, you, you need to have a story you're telling when you make something. You, you're not just making decoration. And I feel like a, a lot of illustration and a, a lot of posters, you can get away with really just kind of making a big pretty. Um, but, but I try to usually have some kind of idea or story or something that you can get from the piece that's more than just, for instance, a woman with flowers in her hair. I mean, that's a legit poster. You've all seen women with flowers in her hair before as a poster, but why? What is she doing? You know, is she coming from somewhere? Why does she have flowers in her hair? So I'm, I'm always trying to weave some kind of story into these things. You know, the Foo Fighters, for instance, you've got this rocket ship that crashed, and obviously you've got this astronaut who's going to be eaten by uh, this space monster. I mean, it's a stupid story, but it's still a story that, that engages you. Um, the, the, the term Foo Fighter is what the uh, World War II, the German World War II pilots called unidentified flying objects when they saw them in the sky. Uh, so I thought I would kind of go into that uh, sci-fi thing that, that I've loved since I was a kid. 
system. Um, this was something that Paul Rand actually writes about pretty extensively in Design and the Play Instinct, uh, which is this notion of creating a system of constraints for yourself and then working within those constraints to make something. There's an example in the book of the uh, Japanese puzzle, the name I forget, uh, but it's a traditional. Tangram. Yes, a traditional Japanese puzzle that's made up of seven or nine pieces. And you can, you can reconfigure these pieces to make kind of anything you want. Um, and it's a great exercise for the mind to, instead of having limitless color and limitless shapes, which we do now at a computer, you can do absolutely anything you want. Um, this was entirely created on this grid you see on the right in three colors. Uh, so I, I enjoy doing that to myself sometimes because it, it forces you to get more creative uh, when you limit yourself. Uh, this particular Yaysayer poster was created essentially with those three shapes that you see on the right. I added a few extra uh, just so you know make eyes and whatnot but um, it's a fun way to work. It's, it's much more like just messing around than it is like trying to get a job done when you work that way. Double meaning, visual pun, graphical wit. Um, these always make me feel so smart when I actually manage to make one of these. <laughs> it doesn't happen every time. It's so hard to force. I really am envious of editorial illustrators who can do this every time. Uh, it's amazing when you can really make two ideas merge or three ideas merge into one single graphic, how powerful that can be. Uh, so I'm always kind of hoping I do this, but sometimes it doesn't work out that way and I just have to do something else. But, uh, you know, on, on the left there, that's a, a book cover. Um, it's about women, uh, how they were treated during the Islamic Revolution. Um, they were imprisoned and a, a lot of them were imprisoned for, you know, things you shouldn't be imprisoned for. Uh, so they're basically pawns in this big game is where that's going to. And then, you know, the Edward Sharp where this, uh, this person's looking into himself. Uh, really like doing those. Uh, here's another one that I originally created this image just to be oxymoronic. Um, it was simply, let's take two things that are at the farthest side of the spectrum from one another and put them together. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of intent on my part. It's actually, it's called Rainbow Warrior which was the name of the Greenpeace ship that was shrunk by, or sunk by the French government in 1985 or wherever that was. Um, but I never have put out an artist statement about this image. I've just put it out in the world and it is amazing what people read into it. I have, um, there are so many triple extra large t-shirts in Texas with this printed on the front with like, with like gun dudes who like love this thing. Um, there are also hundreds of gays and lesbians who have these stickers on their cars. Um, there are tons of just bros who like, dude, that's sick, um, who, who just buy it and you know, they do whatever they do with it. It, it speaks to so many people because I think people see what they want to see in it. So it's, it's been really interesting because I, I never tell them what it is like, well, what is it? I'm like, well, what do you think it is? And, you know, they buy one or they don't. And uh, how many ways can you draw a skull? This has kind of become a running, uh, a running thing in all these presentations I've done because uh, I don't know if you were all were here earlier, but it's so easy to cop out on a rock poster and draw a skull. Um, <laughs> Because you can, I mean, name a band and I can make a skull work for it somehow, and they're really fun to draw. And it's, it's one of these symbols that dates back to prehistory, like the hand, like the face, um, that speaks to everybody across all languages, across all national borders. Uh, and it's just really cool, and you can always sell rock posters with skulls on them. So I kind of try to limit myself to one a month, but, uh, you know, I, I have probably 25 different posters with, with different skulls on them. Um, we were talking earlier about uh, when I do an ex exhibition of my work anywhere, I have to tell whoever's hanging it to separate the skulls, the birds, and the flowers, because you can get these clumps where it's like, oh, Dan just does, like, birds. Oh, wait, no, he does mm, flowers, too. And, and so... Um, it's one of those things I get back to a lot, but I try to force myself to uh, step outside that boundary because it's, it's, it's a little bit too much of a gimme. And I think that was it for the slide presentation. Cool, so let's have a conversation. I think now we talk about things. Yeah, that was so much fun. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. So, um, so I know a little bit about your, your background that you like kind of worked in kind of a Kinko's kind of place like I did I did your own, uh, well like you came to design in, in a very roundabout way making rock posters on yeah. campus I came to design with a lot of skulls on them right? yes a lot of skull, skulls skulls yeah. led me to design and I'm still living off them today um, 
I originally came to design, I think, through the punk movement in the 80s when the, there was the music, which was awesome, but it also came with this built-in art movement. You could get a skateboard with uh, you know, a puss head drawing on the bottom. You could buy an album cover with uh, awesome album art. You could buy t-shirts. You could buy zines. There was all this incredible art. And I'd always drawn, even since I was a little kid, I just was the kid who copied the Sunday funnies, you know, and comic books and all that stuff. So I, I taught myself how to do all of that. And when I discovered punk when I was 14 or 15, I took those same skills that I used to draw, you know, the Bloom County characters and Doonesbury and stuff, and I took them and I was like, oh, well, I can draw skulls. Uh, so I started doing that just because it was fun. I never really intended it to be a vocation or anything. Um, it eventually turned into doing posters when I attended the University of Oregon. Uh, I, uh, some guy who I lived with saw me drawing some graffiti and was like, hey, do you want to do posters? And I was like, eh, maybe. And he's like, I'll give you 20 bucks and all the beer you can drink. And I'm like, oh, sweet. So I, I jumped on that. And then once I saw the posters up on the street, it was like legal graffiti. It was like, all right, I make this thing once, and then this army of people run around and tack them up all over town. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is really pretty cool. Um, once I graduated college with a sociology degree, uh, I needed to get work, and uh, I wanted to, at that point I decided design was the way to go. So you went to real school. I didn't go to real school yet. I tried to make it work by a sort of a grassroots effort. Uh, so I worked in digital pre-press. I was a press operator. I printed church t-shirts. I did all those, these really sort of uh, low-level graphics gigs attempting to climb the ladder, uh, but it, it didn't work at all. There was no ladder to be climbed. Uh, so I went, I went back to school in California at, at uh, CCA in San Francisco. Um, and what did you learn there? What, your work changed a lot. My work right? changed a lot because I was, I got to see the world outside of the skulls and the snakes and, and all of the stuff that I had been knee deep in, in the world of punk and rock and roll. I was introduced to art, like real art, and real design, or not real, but you know what I mean, like highbrow. Um, I remember sitting in like an art Paul history Rand. class. Yes, uh, I was sitting in an art Paul history. Paul Rand with skulls. Paul That's Rand with skulls. You, right? I, I, well, I was sitting there, and I and a Mondrian. The, the teacher was walking through a Mondrian, and he started You're with like, the apple tree. This shit, right? I was, but he started with the tree, and then walked it through the steps as Mondrian broke the tree down, and I was like, oh shit, I get it. And that was my like, shark jumping moment. I'm like, I can't go back. I now have, I've become like an art snob and I, I now am living in a completely separate world and I can never go back to where I was. And I felt myself cross the Rubicon, but you know, you know what are you gonna do? So I took it forward from there and I eventually kind of- But you brought the skulls with you. I, I brought them with so me, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, you're, um, have you ever been ripped off? Yes. Okay, you want to tell us about that, or is it really sure? Um, no, the the legal battle's over. I mean, the, I have been ripped off a few times. Um, now with uh, the internet and cheap overseas manufacturing, it's really easy for somebody in in China or even somebody here to send something to China to have it made, and then you call up the Chinese factory. They're like. Pfft. Tough luck, dude. I mean, really, they just do not care. They're like, um, well, somebody told us to make it. Um, but the, the latest thing that got ripped off was that uh, the t-shirt design with the, the AK-47 with the rainbow clip. Um, that actually inspired a uh, Jack White song called Machine Gun Silhouette. And so in the liner notes for that, it makes reference to the t-shirt. And so somebody started printing those things on like cafe press and all these places and was getting all this business. So do you feel like Jack White ripped you off? No, Jack White was cool about it. Reference? No, I like mean, where do you draw the line in graphic design? Well, like, did you rip just, off the That skulls? inspired a song. It wasn't so much that somebody actually took the graphic and said, well, I'm just gonna redo this graphic and start selling it. Um, so I was, you know, amazed that Jack White like even cared, which well, that was really cool. But then this guy just started producing these shirts and I had to pay lawyers to, to shut him down. Um, was that effective? Yeah, no, they, they, the thing about that is, uh, there, there's two things about getting ripped off. One is that uh, if it's being sold on the internet, you can, you can post, uh, I don't even know what it's called, your lawyer would know. Um, and it's a takedown notice that says, hey, whatever site this is on, you're responsible for this. Not this guy, but Cafe Press is responsible. So if Cafe Press is like, oh shit, you know, like this, this thing's being sold on our site and our whole site can get knocked down because of it. So they, they walk away from it. Um, 
But the people who you want to rip you off are people like Target. <laughs> because if Target rips you off and then prints a bunch of stuff and sells it, you wait for the season to end, you let them sell and sell and sell, and in fall, when they're done selling their t-shirts and it's time for winter clothes, you walk back and you show them the original and you say, you owe me royalties. And, then and they, they will, they in fact, fire someone in the art department. Yeah, well, the, the, the way it gets ripped off is that uh, Target doesn't make their own art. Target hires firm XYZ, which is usually just a, uh, like a merch firm. Merch firm goes out and hires freelance designers. Freelance designers are only getting paid five, six hundred bucks to do design, so they hit the internet. They see something they think is cool, they grab it, they change the colors or flip it or do whatever they do give it back to, to Merch Company, who says that's great, and gives it to Target, who says that's great, and they print it. So Target doesn't know, Merch Company doesn't know, only person who knows is the $500 designer. But if Target sells 10,000 units... They might not even know. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think know. a lot of, you know, the visual research, I see students do it, where it Everything on the internet's flows. free. Yeah, people just don't necessarily realize that there's an origin to a particular design. Yeah, it, well, I think in graphic design, it's often hard to pinpoint what the origin is. Yeah, uh, right? it's, it's, sometimes it's fairly obvious um, when you've just been sort of completely ripped. Yeah, the gun with the rainbow, it's, yeah. you own that. Right? But if, if Target prints it, you get, a, you, get, you get royalties. So you can make you know, a $20,000 payday for having done nothing, which is kind of nice. So you do a lot of work for, for bands, and I've heard you say, like, people will come up to you and say, how can I make a Beck poster? Mm -hmm. What do you tell them? Uh, you can't. Uh, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that doing these posters has taken me 20 years to do a Beck poster. Um, you could probably do it faster now, thanks to the internet and all these things, but um, unless you already have a body of work that Beck can see, he's not gonna hire you to do a poster. So, so I always tell people to, to find a passion project, something where you have 100% control over the creative, whether it's a zine or a website or a blog or, or whatever it is, and, and jump on that and just kill it like for a couple of years. Just kill it and keep killing it and keep killing it. And eventually, because of the internet, that is going to get out into the world and somebody's going to see it. And that's when Beck calls you. Beck says, hey, you know, I'm doing this new insert for my new album and I want it to be a zine and your zine's awesome. Can you do that zine for me? But that's all these types of clients, they, they come to you because they want you to do a little piece of your thing for them, uh, which is very different than what I call service design, which is where they come to you and say, hi, we're the pink elephant car wash and we need a pink elephant. And you draw a pink elephant, you give it to them, you get a bill. And, and you know, that's, that's uh, service design. Um, it's just like any other trade. Uh, this is more like being hired to make somebody art. And uh, that requires a body of work for them to see. Because a lot of these people don't really have the vision to be like, this guy, he's the guy who could do that great thing for us. They need to have seen one already, or 10, or 20. Yeah. So um, any questions? I kind of want to open it up to the group here and want to know how to make something beautiful or weird or crazy. I think there was a question earlier about screen printing and we had some fun conversations. Or I could we just talk all night. Where do I find inspiration and ideas? I, I, some of them. Um, never draw the name. Don't ever draw the lyrics. Those are the, I mean, it's really easy to draw like, oh, they're the white stripes. I'll draw some stripes, you know. Um, but that's a really bad place to start. And, and lyrics are also kind of just, it's a little cliched. Um, so those are the things you don't do. What you do do to find inspiration, I don't even know. I mean, it's the same as finding inspiration for anything else. Uh, sit down and start working is honestly kind of, you know, put the music on, familiarize yourself with what they sound like. Because especially with band posters, there's kind of a vibe you're trying to hit. You don't necessarily need to summarize something. Like if you're doing editorial about 
veterans with PTSD coming back from Afghanistan. You kind of need to work in veteran Afghanistan PTSD into your drawing. Um, when you're just doing a poster for a band, it's way more open than that. So it gets down to kind of making restraints for yourself. You got to write your own brief. You're like, oh, well, these guys like are kind the of... with the Foo Fighters. Right. How did you come up with that? I drew the name. That was kind of a bad thing. But not um, really, <laughs> like the, the alien and right. the girl. And well, uh, okay, that's a great place. knife and I, fork. I've never seen an alien monster I started, use a knife and fork. That's true. I started and with the notion cool of the Foo Fighter, which was just a, a... What I'm looking for on these things is what I call the point of entry, which is if you, if you have an onion skin or an onion and you're trying... The hardest thing is to pierce the outside. And once you're in there, you start cutting through the layers of the design and it gets easier and easier as you get to the center, which is where the good design is. But getting through that tough outer skin is is that thing that you need and, and it can start... You can start anywhere. Uh, for instance, with the name Foo Fighters, I was like, okay... Um, what does this mean? So I looked it up, because it's a weird word, you gotta admit. And I was like, oh, it's World War II pilots had a, and the German pilots had a name for UFOs. And that just got me going on this whole thing with UFOs and aliens and right, but when I hear that name, I always think of food fight. And is yeah, it's that a, it's where a the weird knife name, right? Come from because that's such a nice. I mean, that's thing. kind of the fun thing about design is you're constantly getting to learn things. It keeps you alive to do your research. Uh, so yeah, I just I went into that direction, and I've always liked uh, golden era comic books. The uh, the stuff sort of pre 1960s, whenever they put rules on them and, and made them suck. Um, but they used to be really raw. Like if you look at old comic books, they're horrible. People stabbing each other in the eyes with you know just really terrible terrible stuff. Uh, but that just inspired me to kind of go that route. And then you look for any time you can get some traction. You're like, all right, I'm trying these ideas and these all suck, but this one right here is starting to work. I'm going to follow that thread. Uh, and my process is a lot about following a thread of discovery. I don't sit down and sketch and sketch and sketch and sketch and then just take that sketch to the computer and execute it. There's a lot of meandering going on uh, before I get to that final solution. Yeah, what else? What else do you want to know from this visual genius? Brian Boyce. Is there a relationship between the poster or the performance and artwork for album? Like, do you cross that I do album artwork. It's usually not the same artwork that's on a poster. I certainly would love to do that. That would kind of kill two birds with one stone. So I could charge them twice. What's that dialogue? Well, each concert usually has its own poster, and people have kind of come to expect that when I go see Wilco and I see them in Boston, I can buy the Boston poster, and when I come to see them in New York, I can get the New York poster, and, and it becomes and part of the thing. Do you get to do all of those, or just sometimes? For one sometimes they'll hire you to do a whole tour and you'll do six or a, a, a portion of a tour, or maybe a one night, or we'll turn into three nights, so you do three posters. Uh, you know, if they, somebody really big is, is playing in town, they're like, oh, we sold all the tickets for the first night, you know, let's just do two in a row. You can do something like where there's, where there's two posters that make something bigger when you put them next to each other. There's, there's opportunities like that. Um, but the album art is, is one thing that just exists as the album. The poster art really varies from place to place and day to day. And the collectors, and there's a lot of people who just who have mountains of these things, really like that whole fact that it's not the same poster for all ten shows. But is that a discussion you have with the band manager or the venue manager? Or who hires me to do the work? Who, yeah, who, who, who says... Love it. it used to be the promoters in the venues. Before the day of the internet, and the, how I got my start was working with uh, promoters who would be, that was their job to promote the show. And so they're like, such and such a band is coming tonight, and we need a poster for the event. We got this guy, Dan, who's going to make a poster for the event. What eventually happened was the posters became so popular that they started selling them at the merch table next to the CDs and the t-shirts. Uh, and the bands kind of wanted to start getting in on that action because yeah. they weren't the ones commissioning the posters. And then oftentimes they weren't the ones making the money off the sales. Uh, so they started contacting the artists who had already been making posters for a while. And now thanks to the internet, the artists could contact the bands because you can actually look up the management company and find the person to call. And, and that's a lot easier to do than back when it was just kind of waiting for a phone call, which is how it used to happen. Uh, so it used to be promoters and venues. Now it's primarily bands and merchandise companies. Uh, and people who are a lot cl more closely related to the band itself. 
What else? You got a question? You know, the thing about that is that the more you like the band, the harder it is to do the poster. Um, and I didn't show it tonight, but I did a Sonic Youth poster. It's, it's on like well, the first page of the book. I did that poster 12 times. And I threw every single one of them away. And I, I mean, I almost wanted to throw myself a bridge. It was such a horrible process because I'd make the entire poster and then sit back and be like, nope, do it again, do it again, do it again. Um, because that band had such a resonance to me that I needed to, to make it work. Eventually, it was kind of a breakthrough moment for me because I worked a couple things out that I still use to this day. So it, it's, there's a, it's a good exercise to make the same thing 12 times, but it's a horrible experience. Um, so sure, I've never done a Nirvana poster. You know, that would be, I've never done a Pixies poster. Um, all those bands that were, that sort of shaped the way I thought between the ages of 14 and 25, uh, most of them have, have since disbanded and I only started doing posters when I was like 23, so I got to catch the tail end of that. I could have done a Nirvana poster kind of thing, but nobody asked, but they were still together when I was started making posters. I've done Pavement and other bands from that era, but um, so there's lots of bands, but I think, I think it would be horrible. I honestly think did it would working, be the worst experience of my life. Did working for a band ever just ruin the music for you? Yeah, I think the problem is that lots of times you get hired not by the band, but by the band's management. And, um, and people's people are usually kind of awful because that's their job. And, and the, the people in the band are still great guys usually, but the, their people are not that nice. And, and uh, yeah, I don't want to talk too much crap about them, but yeah, there's, there's certainly been experiences that have been Yeah, this will be on the off internet. Off-putting, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. What else? What do you want to know? Anyone know anything about? Yes, Michael. Talk a little bit about like having a trial and like, or like feeling like part of the band and like trying to do something else. Sure. Um, the, the, the style I have evolved on its own, so it wasn't something where I sat down one day and said, I'm going to draw this way. Um, it's, it's, Starting to draw when you're four and then just never stopping is how I've wound up where I am. A lot of it's been driven by the tools. Like I pointed out earlier, Illustrator has had a pretty big effect on how I draw. Um, screen printing has had a pretty big effect on how I draw because screen printing is kind of like making stencils, so you want to keep it simple. Um, so the style developed, and as it developed, I would start to think, wow, this looks really simple and kind of minimal. Maybe I should start looking at more artists that work minimally. And you're like, wow, Saul Bass is pretty cool, and Paul Rand's pretty cool. And so you start kind of pulling that in, and the Eames is. Um, currently, I'm into like early 70s stuff, you know, kind of psychedelic. We were just talking earlier about Yellow Submarine. Um, so it's, it still has that flavor of the 50s and 60s, but gets a whole lot weirder. But I think one of the points in your work, and I know you write about it in your book, is that you're really a graphic designer mm -hmm. creating images as opposed to an illustrator. Yes. And I think that's a really interesting distinction. I know there's a lot of um, graphic designers in the room. You know, like as a graphic designer, how do you create images? I think like the approach is that, different. You, you yeah, what makes it, that approach? For me, and maybe, maybe this will answer your question a little better, I spent a long time in San Francisco making logos. And I learned how to take an idea and carve it down to the point where I worked at one inch by one inch in black and white. And if you can make an idea work like that, then you can blow it back up again. It, and it looks great. And if you have some extra space, now that it's big, you can fill it with flowers, which is what I do. <laughs> um, but uh, that, that's, yeah, flowers and skulls. Um, but I, I think that's, that's a lot of where this idea of really trimming it down, because I'm kind of a, I'm a whittler. I start with the block like a, like a sculptor, and I cut my ideas down, and I throw stuff away, and I'm like, I don't need that, I don't need that. Whereas a lot of people start with the blank page, and like a painter, they build it up. And I think it's a much more designerly approach to pare down and to try to make it into this, this iconic logo-like image than it is to sit there with a double lot brush and a, and a little you know, spyglass thing and like do this for 40 hours, which is what a lot of the more illustrative posters really are, is this exercise in um, self-flagellation. <laughs> That's one way of defining <laughs> it. What else? What do you want to know? Yeah. Seems like your work, you span, like you started probably before the internet, mm -hmm. and you continue to work straight through the internet. How has it? That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is: Is there an internet version of the poster now? 
Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great question. I'll think about the second one while I'm answering the first one, uh, which I've already forgotten. Um, uh, you got me thinking. Uh, how, has it, how, how has the internet influenced the poster? I, th I think the biggest influence the internet has had is that it's allowed me not to have a real job, <laughs> which is which is huge because I can now that spend 40 or 50 hours or 60 or 70 hours just doing this, which I couldn't have done 20 years ago when I started. I tried and I failed and I had to go back to school and kind of attack the problem from a different direction, but um, none of my clients are, I live in Portland, Oregon, and I have, maybe, I do a couple things locally, kind of just for the hell of it, but all of my good clients are somewhere else. They're usually in San Francisco, New York, Paris, wherever, places where there's money, not Portland. Um, and that was impossible, literally impossible before the internet for somebody like me to survive and have a studio, a, like a thriving business. Um, it's all done, it's all done via the internet. And I think that's probably the biggest thing. Uh, maybe also the iconicness of my work translates well to the internet because it shrinks really well. Because you know, you look at something that looks great when it's three feet tall, and it might be mud when it's a little tiny JPEG. But my stuff, being based on logos, <laughs> you know, you can shrink it to logo size, and you can still read it. So I think maybe that helps the distribution of my work because uh, the uh, the one thing leads to another, which is the, the title of the book, is really about the path your work can cut for you, you know, it just, it opens doors that you didn't think would open up, and, and that's all coming to me through, I put out an image, somebody out there sees it, and they give me a call, and it leads to another opportunity. Um, and then, an internet version of a poster. I don't know. I don't think there's anything that's really that don't different. do you think, like, Instagram and... Yeah. You know, yeah, maybe Instagram. There's so many images that are made to be shown on Instagram. I have people that hire me to do yeah. Instagram campaigns. I mean, that's a poster that's... Yeah, I do you know, stuff big. that they only use on their Instagram accounts. So maybe that is the, the internet poster, the internet telephone pole that you hang your stuff to. Great question. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, see, I'm waiting for Instagram to really start doing little animations. Like, I know they do the, the kind of Vine style stuff, but I, I love the, um, the little three second shorts p some people make. And, and, or no, it's Facebook that doesn't have those yet. Is it Facebook? Yeah. Those are so cool. Anything else? Yeah. I think that's like kind of consistent about Instagram, how it's up for the screen, the poster does, mm -hmm. or format. But I was going to ask, like, how do you separate the screen from your work? You mentioned earlier, like, the format of the latest thing. Well, a couple of them are set for me. Um, screen printing, like I said, every color you add is, is added expense and time, and most clients will not pay for more than three or four colors unless they really think they're going to get something back on that. Um, you will see people doing 20 color prints on holographic paper and stuff like that, but they feel like they can sell those uh, for a higher dollar. Um, and then format wise 18 by 24 almost always I sometimes I'll do stuff bigger but then it doesn't fit with the other ones when I try to travel and stuff so um, they're almost always the same shape I like the pragmatic of what we do <laughs> it's a, even coming here I'm like crap these three posters are bigger than the other 30 like what am I gonna do with these things well, you look at books it's the same thing you know they got to fit on the damn shelf yeah uh, so we got color we got size um, those are already two really big constraints right there and then, you know, stylistically, I try to keep it simple, just because um, I think that's what people expect of me, is maybe what I expect of myself. So I'm not going to go and draw something really complicated. I, I did just recently do an experiment where I, uh, I inverted my process, which is usually to, uh, to pare down and to make something simpler and simpler. I had two months to do a poster over the winter, and winter's dead. After New Year's, there's just no posters until spring, because nobody's on tour. Um, but I did get one gig, and so I said, all I'm going to do to this poster is I'm just going to keep adding. For two months, I'm going to work on this thing, and I'm just going to keep adding. And I'm not going to have a concept. There's no idea behind this poster, and there's no stopping point. And I eventually came up with this, like, seven-color thing, and the client was like, I can't print that. So I did pare it down to three, but it is one of my most overwrought posters ever, just because I just tried to see what would happen if I did it the other way. It's not in the book, but you know, it's on my, my website. Go see if you can find it. <laughs> see, if I tell you, you won't know, but I'd go take a look and see which one of them looks overwrought. <laughs> <laughs> it's Dan's worst poster. Just yeah, I don't Google know if it's worst. That. It might it might be my best. That's the thing. I don't dislike it. It's just that it's it, I, I inverted everything and, and to see what I would come up with. It's got flowers on it, though. That's good. <laughs> 
Those are the ones where the clients aren't direct. Literally, if you have a client who starts art directing, which happens to me, they're like, oh, can we, do? and I'm like, all right, let's go through my site, and we start looking, and I'm like, do you like that poster? They're like, no, and I'm like, you know why you don't like that one? Because the client art directed it. It's true. It, that one of the things about rock posters is you need to give a huge amount of freedom for them to work. The minute you start reeling it, I mean, most design, you're like, you show your wild idea, and they're like, okay, let's pull that in a little bit. And that's kind of the way the design process works. With rock posters, it's, it's the reverse. It's sort of like, that's all you got? Come on, like, <laughs> make it weirder. But the ones where they reel it in and compromise it are always the worst ones. <laughs> Okay, anybody else got a question? Yeah, sir. So we've seen sort of in our time slow death of the printed newspaper and books. We're sort of seeing it happen slowly. I know here at the Strand mm -hmm. we don't uh, care, but like, we've seen it sort of evolve where newspapers are printed less, lots of things are printed less. Do you see that have an effect on, on posters? And I do, um, and I think that's actually good for the poster uh, because Everything's digital now, and I think there are certain things like vinyl records, rock posters, and a few other things that are serving as a form of, of analog backlash, because now you can go buy your favorite album and never own the album. You can go see your favorite, you know, your entire life can happen like in this little supercomputer in your pocket. And I think people like the tactile stuff. They actually enjoy buying a piece of paper at a show and taking it home and hanging it on the wall and being able to look at it. And so I think all this, this extreme digital, um, vaporware is actually kind of helping. I don't think 30 years ago the rock poster would have would have taken off this, the way it has now. Because uh, there's there's such a demand and such an interest in, in that and vinyl and, and a few other things, collectible toys, um, that I, I really think is because people miss being able to hold an object. Yeah, I think a lot of people think that posters are made to be out on the street to promote the show, but really most of your posters are merchandise. Yeah, they started out on this. And that's a how street. the psychedelic posters of the '60s—they mm -hmm. weren't meant to advertise. They were a souvenir of the event, and they were a visual analog for the music and the sex and the drugs that went with the music. And they—they they were not ads. <laughs> and I think that's really important, and I think most of your posters. They're not They're really all merchandise, ads, yeah. right? They are a, an, an accompaniment and kind of visual evidence of the music. Which I sort of miss. Your, your book music. has a bit on sniping. Um, which is where people will put up these, uh, and they're, not, they're sort of underground posters. Uh, they come up with their own thing. They say, look, I'm, I'm protesting AIDS. I'm protesting whatever it is. I'm going to make 300 posters and just hang them up. Nobody's paying me to do this. I just want to do it. Um, but that's really the power of the poster is putting it out into the world like that. And, and I, I'm kind of sad that mine don't go out in the world that way anymore. Um, it would be ridiculous to hang a $25 poster on the street. <laughs> but uh, it's also... But that's not its that. purpose. Right, right. It, it's and not its purpose, but it should be. It's a poster, right? So if a poster doesn't get posted, it's kind of sad. Are they cutting us off? No? Two minutes? Yeah, so All maybe right. we'll, if anybody has one last question, we'll... Yeah. Yeah, Brian. Do you have any plans for uh, motion and sequence? Yes, I am doing a lot more motion work these days. Um, it's such a natural when you have these digital files. Right, right? because I do everything digitally. It, it translates perfectly uh, over into After Effects, which is where everybody's doing motion right now. Um, so, and my, my interest now is to show people that these images don't have to live on an 18 by 24 piece of paper. I, I worked really hard to get into the world of posters, and now I'm kind of working really hard to get out of the world of posters and doing children's books and fabrics and all these other things I'm doing because posters are great, and I don't intend to stop doing them, but there's a lot of other places where you can put graphics. It, just, it doesn't have to just be on, on a piece of paper. Yeah. Great. Well, great. Thanks a lot, Emily. Thanks.